You are listening to Spoon Press Audio. Stories that are good for your mental health. Hello, my name is Anna Im and I am the creator and owner of Spoon Press. If this is your first time listening, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce myself and share with you the inspiration behind these stories. I was born in South Africa in a town called Bloemfontein, right in the middle of the country, isolated from the coast and surrounded by mostly grasslands and sheep farms. My father was an award-winning poet and academic. He was a lecturer in literature science at the university, So our house was always filled with books and art, and from an early age I was exposed to the cream of the crop in literature, films and theatre. Some of the greatest South African artists and authors sat at our table, and my father was loved and admired by all of them. He was also a narcissist, with serious psychopathic tendencies. A cruel, manipulative, hyper-intelligent man who broke my brain and caused me to see myself and the world around me in a distorted way for a long, long time. There are three things you should know about Bloemfontein. First, it was the site of many bloody battles between the British armies and the Boers during the Second Boer War between 1899 and 1902. It was also the location of a very large concentration camp in which women and children died by the thousands of starvation and disease. The house in which I grew up was built on what must have been the site of a commando camp of the British, because over the years we found loads of rusty old horseshoes, broken uniform buttons and Lee Medford bullet casings in the garden. So in a way, I guess, from my very first years there in the middle of nowhere, my story was already interwoven with that of the British. The second thing you should know about Bloemfontein is that it is the birthplace of J.R.R. Tolkien, author of Lord of the Rings. Tolkien didn't live there long, however. The family moved away shortly after his birth. Nonetheless, to Bloemfonteiners, this little fun fact is an important claim to fame, and therefore they believe that it belongs on the map amongst all the great literature locations in the world. Whether this is true, you can decide for yourself. Bloemfontein is also the capital of what used to be the old Orange Free State province. Now, as Max Verstappen fans will know, orange is the national colour of the Netherlands, And that was the only reason why the Dutch included it when they named the province the Orange Free State during their short reign. But, and this is the third and most important thing you should know about Bloemfontein, in the late afternoons, before the sun sets over the flatlands, and in the morning just before it rises, there is a soft orange glow that settles on everything. Like a filter, it turns the tall grass and the trees and the sides of the buildings into a monochrome landscape, It creeps through the open windows and paints orange shapes on your walls and over your floors. And if you hold out your arm, the orange will settle there like pixie dust and its warmth will creep into your skin. This magical hour lasts only a few minutes, twice a day. But when I think back on Bloemfontein, on the trauma and the claustrophobic isolation of my childhood, it is this orange glow I remember best. That and the stories, of course. It was in Bloemfontein's children's library, through the glass doors and up the stairs and through another door, where I first discovered the magic of stories. Or rather, this was where stories first materialised for me in delicious dusty smells, creaky floorboards, smooth plastic covers and that distinctive kajik, kajik, kajik of the librarian's stamp in the front of my books. The truth is that the stories were always there, long before I knew about them. And like the old bullet casings in our backyard, I would dig up traces of them throughout my life. My earliest memories are of my mother reading to me. Now, I don't remember this, but she told me that as a baby who could barely sit up, I would sway back and forth to the sound of her voice and the rhythm of the words, as if they were music. From the moment I could properly hold and manipulate a crayon, I started copying the shape of those words from the books onto sheets of paper, I could not yet read, so the shapes held no meaning to me, but I understood that they were portals to stories, and there was some deeply ingrained instinct in me to write them down. I was born with the frustration of unwritten stories in my fingers. When I was four years old, I wrote my first story about a king and his flower garden. 
I dictated it word for word to my kindergarten teacher and she had to write it down and then read it back to me so I could make the necessary edits. In the end, she stapled the pages together to resemble a book and I took it home. I would go on to write many other stories in a similar fashion and then later in my own uncertain handwriting, but I have this first manuscript to this day. It was one of the few things that survived from my tumultuous childhood in Bloemfontein. By the time I left, in 1994, I was an angry, self-destructive teenager with two suicide attempts below my belt. I followed a boyfriend to Cape Town and enrolled at a teacher's college. This was not because I had a preference or a love for teaching. The only thing I ever wanted to be was a writer. But I was made to believe from an early age, by the same education system, that writing was a hobby and not a career. And thus, my only talent was meaningless in the grand scheme of things. No, I became a teacher because it was an easy course, cheap and short, and I needed to get out of the house. Also, my father said that I could study anything but teaching, and that kind of clinched the deal for me. So I took my boxes full of handwritten stories from under my bed, a suitcase full of clothes, and I left home, shutting the door tightly behind me. I vowed to live a free life and to be happy, no matter the cost. Years later, I would wonder if the women and children who had survived those concentration camps would also remember the orange sun. Even here in London, where skies are grey, I can still close my eyes and feel its warmth on my face. No matter how much I would have wanted it to, Bloemfontein never really left me. I lived in Cape Town for 28 years. After obtaining my education diploma, I got a job at a primary school teaching a class of eight-year-olds. I was 21 and I had no clue what I was doing. The school I landed up at was in a very poor neighbourhood. The children came from previously disadvantaged areas and often lived in homes where there were serious social and economic issues like alcoholism, violence, drugs, gangs. These kids came to school in the morning severely unsettled and disruptive. One of the boys in my class had witnessed, for instance, his uncle murdering his father during an argument. One of the girls and her siblings were sleeping in a closet. Another girl showed clear signs of being molested, and she would wet the carpet in the classroom every morning. I was in way over my head. But I realized that there was no point in trying to teach these children mathematics, or anything else for that matter, while they were so traumatized. And so I turned to the only remedy I knew, stories. Every morning when the kids came in, I made them sit down on the carpet and then I would read them stories. I read until I could feel them settle, sometimes 10 minutes, sometimes hours, sometimes the whole day until the bell rang at the end of it. I read anything I could lay my hands on, Roald Dahl to the Brothers Grimm, Pippi Longstocking to Lewis Carroll, And when we had worked our way through the small school library, I started writing my own stories. In these stories, I would often cast the students themselves as the main characters, building stories around some of the bad things that had happened to them, disguising the violence as dragons and monsters, and dethroning it with humour and bravery and imagination. Now, of course, none of the teachers knew what I was doing, and halfway through the year, I started to worry about the syllabus, about how far behind we were on academics, I knew that at the end of the year my students would be tested by the head of department and I would probably be sacked. But by then we were too far in already. The stories were transforming my students into calmer, happier children who began to draw the most beautiful pictures, who spent hours in the reading corner and even started to write their own stories. I could see them grow in confidence. I could see them show more empathy towards one another. I could see the innocence of childhood seep back into their faces a little bit more every day, as if they were being transformed by some magic healing potion. One day during break, the headmaster called me into his office. I was sure I had been found out and that I was in deep trouble, especially when he pointed out the window to the school grounds and asked, Miss Stradom, are those your students? I looked and saw my children lying quietly in a group under the trees, each with a book, while the rest of the school was running about, kicking balls on the sport fields. Um, yes, I said, and I braced myself for what was to come. But then the headmaster turned to me, an amused look on his face, and he asked, How on earth do you get them to do that?
The end of the year came and my students were on par with all the other classes in mathematics and all the other subjects as well. It didn't make any sense, since we had spent less than 5% of our time on academics. It seemed that their diet of stories had not only helped them emotionally and mentally, as I had first thought, but it also enhanced their ability to learn and to remember facts. I knew then that I was on to something. And so for the next three years I experimented with this. I did a lot of research and studied the effects of fiction on the brain and the use of stories in play therapy. I read up on the psychological impact of using certain words, certain sounds, images and symbols in stories. I wrote many, many children's stories, testing my theories on my students. I found, for instance, that there is a hypnotic, soothing power in repetition, repetition of sounds and images, colours. And I learned to structure sentences to create a rhythm that was pleasing to the ear. I found that there is a tipping point between darkness and light, between good and evil, fear and bravery, and I learned exactly how far the storyline could be bent before it became destructive. How to make my stories gripping and suspenseful and take a real good close look at the darkness, confront it without making the stories disturbing. I believe that stories have a much deeper impact on the brain than any other medium on earth, even music. Stories build thought patterns. They mold themselves into our DNA, become part of our souls in a way nothing else does. The right story at the right time can change the way we see the world forever. During my years of teaching, I experienced firsthand how stories can act as a bungee cord, breaking our fall and yanking us back to safety. I learned how a habit of reading can make the brain resilient against trauma. And I began to understand why, twice, with the barrel of my father's pistol pressed against my head, I did not pull the trigger. I coped with my abusive childhood by escaping into books, and little did I know that when I needed it most, those stories would save me. Because when I was at the edge of that cliff, in my darkest storm, it was the voice of all those stories combined that called up to me from somewhere deep inside. What if you wait one more day, they whispered, and everything changes. Stories create a muscle memory of hope. They teach us not to fear the villains, that it is almost always darkest before the dawn, that dragons can be slayed, lives can be completely changed, and heroes are often hidden in the unlikeliest of individuals. So after four years of teaching, I had enough evidence that my mentors were wrong, that writing was indeed not just a hobby, but an essential service, and that I would be far more useful to the world as an author than I ever was as a teacher. I quit my job and set out to change the world one story at a time. Over the years, starting from my early teens, I often sent my short stories to magazines. The replies were almost always the same. Thank you for your submission, but your style is not right for a short story. And when I sent manuscripts to publishers, I was told that my style was not right for novels. I tried poetry as well, but got the same response every time. It left me confused and more than a little frustrated, since no one was able to tell me what my style was right for, only what it wasn't right for. Soon after I quit teaching, I saw a stage production and I thought, I can do that. And so I sat down and I wrote a play called The Ragdoll. It was my first attempt at a performance script, but somehow it felt easy. It just flowed and I thought, maybe this is what my style is. Maybe I am a playwright. A friend of mine who was an amateur actress starred in this one-man play of mine. It had seven sold-out performances in small theatres in Cape Town. The ragdoll told the story of a woman called Rosie, who believed herself to be a ragdoll, living in a toy box and taking pride in a neat and controlled life. But as the play progressed, she started to unravel. Memories started to surface of a life she had before, a life that was real. And she grew conflicted until eventually, in the end, she decided to be brave and walk out, leaving the safety and the confines of the box behind. It was my personal statement to the industry in a way, as I took the bold step towards a professional writing career. But plays like that do not make money, especially in South Africa. I knew that I needed some form of income and soon, if I wanted to sustain my writing, I needed some kind of business idea, otherwise I would soon find myself back in the classroom, teaching again. What can I sell, I thought, 
And then I remembered all the children's stories I had written for my students. I still had them. There was about 50 stories in total. I had access to a small home studio at the time, and so I asked my actress friend to read seven of these stories, and we recorded them. And voila, I had a children's story CD I could sell. And lo and behold, it sold like hotcakes. The newspapers caught up on it, and soon we were shipping CDs all over the country, and parents were asking for more. We recorded seven more stories and released a second CD, then a third and a fourth. And by the time we had released seven CDs, I had to start writing more stories to supply in the growing demand. My children's stories were a bit of a phenomenon, as it turned out. Parents and teachers and therapists were sending feedback about the effect these stories had on the children. Enhanced concentration, better vocabulary, reading, creativity, and all the other signs I had picked up in my students as well. The stories helped kids process emotions, difficult situations. It relaxed them, made them more playful. This little venture, that was only supposed to fund my writing, grew all by itself into a full-on proper business. I registered Anna in Productions PTY Limited in 2006, and later we dropped the productions and it only became Anna M. Limited. I appointed staff to help with the shipping of the orders and started looking around for a larger variety of voice artists. And that's when we entered the celebrity arena. Once the first famous actress recorded a story CD for us, it was easy to hook the others. Soon we had a stream of celebrities lining up to record my children's stories, and I kept writing, writing, writing new material. I wrote more children's stories than I ever wanted to. I wrote on demand, like a queen bee. I kept producing, producing, producing. And as the business grew, I became aware of a small little sadness inside my chest. I would stand in front of the window of our large offices in the morning and watch the planes fly over. And I would wonder why I felt so discontent. Something was tugging at my heart. Something was starving inside of me. But I had no time to figure out what it was. I had stories to write and customers to serve. I was making the children so happy. I was making the parents happy. My staff were happy because they were hanging out with celebrities. Everyone was having a ball. In 2015, I was awarded Afri Growth's Award for Small Business of the Year. By then, we had more than 500 sales agents selling our CDs to parents and schools across the country. It was madness. We were on a treadmill and weeks, months, years were flying by. I was writing, so why was I so sad? I wondered. Wasn't this what I wanted? The thing is, I recorded that first CD because I wanted an income to fund my writing. And now my income was being sustained by my writing. I was constantly feeding a children's story monster and I couldn't remember ever making the decision to become a children's story author. It just kind of happened. After 3,000 stories, I knew that I would go mad if I didn't write something else, anything else. And so finally, for the sake of my sanity, I took some time off and I wrote a steamy romance novel. I self-published it as a paperback, just to taste the waters. Not everybody loved the idea, and we lost a few clients who said that they won't be buying children's stories from someone who writes steamy romances. But the people who read it loved it. And I was surprised to receive the same feedback as I did from the children's stories. The story relaxed people, lifted their feelings of depression and anxiety, helped them process past traumas. Although I never intentionally set out to do that, I just wanted to write a fun love story. And so I decided to put on a thick skin and I wrote 20 more such romance novels. Yes, 20. I incorporated what I had learned from all those children's stories and filled the books with loads of humour, quirky characters, cliffhangers, short chapters and that ever-important balance between darkness and light. These books took me out of my comfort zone and brought relief to the claustrophobia I had been feeling. But after doing it 21 times, I was ready to move on from romance novels. And so, in 2019, I wrote and published my first suspense novel, What Poisonous Things. Many people believe that the reason the business eventually failed was because my attention was now divided between what I wanted to write and what I had to write, what sold. And that is not true. During the last few years of the business, I worked harder than ever, never taking a holiday, never taking a weekend off. 
I developed writing courses for up-and-coming children's story authors and I trained the best of these writers to write for us. I was still in front of all the production. I did the recordings myself, edited all the stories, did all the marketing. We continued to roll out new stories consistently every week and even expanded to publishing printed books and magazines as well as workbooks for schools. I travelled all over the country to meet and train our sales reps and regularly appeared on television and radio programmes as a guest speaker talking about the therapeutic power of stories. But in the end, it was not enough to fight the collapsing South African economy and the gruelling rolling power outages called load shedding. I fought back hard, maybe too hard, and three years longer than I should have. Because by the time I was finally forced to liquidate the company I had spent 16 years of my life on, I was close to a breakdown and more than a million rand, that's £40,000, in personal debt. I was fighting ridiculous lawsuits from people I thought who were my friends, who were suing me now over debts of less than a thousand rand. I had the repo man turn up at our door, threatening to take our furniture. I sat in the bathtub in the evenings, crying, and wondering how I got there. Giving up and letting the business die was like switching off the life support of a child. It was the hardest thing I ever had to do, but in the end I had no choice. The liquidation of Anna MPTY Limited was filed by the courts on 26th March 2020, the day before my 44th birthday. The next day, on my birthday, South Africa went into lockdown. The whole world shut down. And everything became really, really quiet. There are three things you should know about South Africa. It is easily the most beautiful country in the world. If you're into loads of sunshine and doing outdoorsy stuff like climbing mountains and surfing waves and hiking through forests, which I wasn't. I always preferred the colder, rainy weather, which is far more conducive to story writing. Also, South Africa has the friendliest people If you're into socialising in groups, large family gatherings, picnics, bursting out in song and watching rugby, loads of rugby, which I wasn't. I could never understand why people couldn't just let me be. And from a young age, I rebelled against this collective pressure to conform. I was branded as antisocial. And thirdly, South Africa has a small but very active publishing industry, of intelligent, skilled, capable and driven people. That is, if you're into playing by the rules of this club, which I wasn't. Now you would think that after writing more than 3,000 children's stories recorded by some of the biggest local celebrities, I would have been recognised as a role player in the industry. But during the 16 years I had my business, I was never acknowledged or mentioned by anyone in the publishing industry. In fact, In 2019, one of the CEOs of one of the largest publishing houses in South Africa said in an interview that there is a huge shortage of children's stories in the country and that absolutely no one was supplying in that need. Over the years, my frustration with the closed community grew and the idea that I could somehow break through that glass ceiling one day and make a name for myself started to wane. Whether the publishing industry in South Africa was simply too small and controlled to share it with anyone, I am not sure. But the weakening economy did not help matters. And by the time I closed the company in 2020, I felt beaten. And so for the first couple of weeks of lockdown, I shut down too. I mourned the loss of my company, the loss of my years, and the loss of my joy. I would sit in the sun for hours just staring But then when the worst of the exhaustion faded, I became aware of a small still voice in my head asking me, who are you? Who was I? And the answer came during those still days of lockdown, I am a writer. And so once again, I returned to the only remedy I knew, stories. I started writing again, not for deadlines, not for money, not for demand but only to heal. I wrote a series of five novellas, light murder mystery romances set in a small town. It flowed easily. It brought me joy. And when I uploaded them as e-books, they apparently brought joy to some other people as well because the downloads started to come in and then the feedback. 
emails from people around the world thanking me for the stories, telling me how it took their minds off the COVID lockdown, how it helped them cope with the anxiety and the stress of what was going on in the world, begging me for more. I wrote more. I wrote a series of 30 more detective novels, releasing one every week, and soon I had quite a following. Slowly but surely, my self-confidence was restored, as was my desire to change the world by telling its stories. At night, I stood by my window and watched the planes fly over, and I started dreaming again, much bigger dreams, dreams that scared me but excited me at the same time. I knew I needed to get out of the isolation of the South African industry, that I had to grow as an author and spread my wings and see what was out there. I decided to write another novel. I wrote two, actually, during lockdown. One was a murder mystery with a supernatural twist called The Thing That Happened at the Show House. And the other was a more serious literary thriller called Bartholomew's In Love. I started researching overseas literary agents and started sending out queries. The rejections came fast and in quick succession. And then I started tweaking. I reworked some of my older manuscripts, sent those out as well. More rejections came. I was growing frustrated. I knew my heart and my head weren't in South Africa anymore. That I wanted to grow and to learn and to do something different, something challenging. I started longing to go to London, to walk those streets, browse those bookshops, see for myself what was out there. But not only was I still in lockdown, I was still a million rands in debt. I knew something had to happen. A door had to open for me. And then... Something did happen. My father died. Almost a year after the onset of lockdown, my father, with whom I had a strained relationship all my life, died of COVID on January 4th, 2021. The last conversation we had was when he phoned me on my birthday the year before, and I told him that I'd liquidated my business. During that phone call, he said to me the most valuable thing he ever told me. He said, You don't have to think about what you want to say to the world you know. You don't have to have a message or a cause. You just have to do that one thing that you were born to do and the work will have a voice of its own. Now I never thought that my father had a lot of money. We sure as hell never saw any of it. He never bought me or my sister anything nice, not a bicycle or a pair of shoes or that toy we really wanted. We never went on fancy holidays or anything like that. I always believe that even if my father did have some money invested somewhere, he wouldn't leave it to us. It would all go to the art foundations or for research at the universities. That was just the way he was, the way he lived. That was also what he told us. But when my sister and I finally drove through to see the lawyer and sitting in the boardroom, the prescribed two meters apart with our faces covered in masks, we were informed that not only was there money and quite a lot of it, but that my father had left it to us. There are three things you should know about London. Everywhere you look, there are stories. From the Mary Poppins chimneys on all the rooftops to the rats and the squirrels and the hundreds of urban foxes that prowl the streets after dark. When you walk on one of the crowded sidewalks surrounded by tourists and buses, you can almost feel it. The footsteps of all the authors who once walked here, William Shakespeare, Charles Dickens, Jane Austen, Agatha Christie, C.S. Lewis, Oscar Wilde, Virginia Woolf, and yes, my old friend, J.R.R. Tolkien. Even the trees here in London are story trees. Whether clad in green leaves or spring blossoms or nothing at all, their branches form the most breathtaking ceilings over the parks and the streets and the rows and rows of terraced houses. The second thing worth mentioning about my new favourite city is the smell of the underground. Every time I walk past one of the vents in the street where they let out the warm air from the underground trains, or the tube as it is called, I get a whiff of that smell and my stomach curls with butterflies. It smells like nothing on earth, like energy, like life, like magic, as if I could spread my arms and the warm air will push me up into the air like Peter Pan to a place where anything is possible. I love the smell of the underground and I am sure that Like the Bloemfontein sun and the stories, it has already crept under my skin and become a part of who I am, and that I will carry it with me wherever I go from now on. The third thing you should know about London 
is that it is home to me like nowhere else. From the first moment I stepped off that plane, I knew that I had found the place where I, Anna M, made sense, and that I had been making my way here long before I knew such a city even existed. I first arrived in London in September 2022, soon after lockdown was lifted. I arrived debt-free, thanks to my father, and with a new passport, a new suitcase, a new everything. We came over as a family on a three-week holiday at first, but with the idea to see if this is a place where we could possibly see ourselves live one day. My husband and my two girls knew by then how starved I was for like-minded, stimulating conversation and the wide arena that is the international publishing industry. How starved I was for having access to the very best in books and theatres and films. But they also believed in me as a writer and agreed that I needed to give myself the best possible shot to do something with my talent. For actors, it is Hollywood, I guess. For artists, Paris. But for authors, it is definitely London. And besides, I wasn't the only one who grew frustrated in South Africa. My two inquisitive, adventurous daughters were also ready for a change. Lockdown had had us all re-examine our lives. And like my husband said, we still had time left to do something exciting with our lives before we would be forced to slow down. We had the option of relocating because the company for which my husband worked as a software engineer in Cape Town had a London branch. He could stay with them and they could move him over to the UK office on a skilled worker visa. It was a big decision. There were four of us and a whole lifetime to let go of. During that first trip, we just enjoyed London and we did a lot of touristy stuff. But when we came back for another four weeks in February 2023, we focused on living in London, working remotely, doing homeschooling, buying groceries, cooking in the evenings and exploring the cheapest and easiest ways to get around. It worked. We loved it. And so we went back to South Africa and packed up our things. The process for the visas was set in motion. We were actually doing this. My father's money was enough to buy us a change of life. It would cover the super expensive immigration costs, pay for the shipping of our furniture, and it would give us one year. Or rather, me. I had one year to throw myself into writing, to learn as much as I could from the industry, to read all the books my heart desired, and to keep on querying literary agents. Surely a year would be enough for me to get some kind of open door, right? The process was not without hiccups. We were already out of our house back in South Africa with our furniture on its way across the ocean when we got the shock of a lifetime. My husband's company would not be able to sponsor him for a visa. They did not have all the right documents in place and there was no way of knowing for sure when they would be able to get it or if. This was the most stressful time of my life. Those few weeks dangling in mid-air between two lives with no place to stand and no idea what was going to happen and all the while bleeding money. But then again, a miracle happened. My husband was offered a position at one of the leading universities in the UK to work on their online system and, get this, the job came with sponsorship. We had our visas. And so it happened that I, once again, took my boxes full of stories and a suitcase full of clothes and left home, closing the door behind me. For two years, one year in Cape Town and one year in London, I have been writing stories like a mad person, writing daily, manuscript after manuscript. I've sent in more than 500 queries of seven different books and received more than 120 rejection letters in total from agents. The rest didn't reply. What was I doing wrong? I had no idea. And as I started tweaking and revising and pruning and chopping away at my writing, I began to lose sight of my voice. Slowly the joy seeped out of the writing and it became forced, calculated, overworked, stressful. I did my best to write the formula, to hit all the beats, to stay within the clearly defined genres and word count and to make my stories look and sound the way I thought they should to be accepted. It didn't work. Book after book was rejected, no matter what I tried. The 12-month time pocket my father's inheritance had bought me was slowly shrinking away. I was running out of ledge. And then one day, one of the agents got back to me. It was the only personal reply I ever received, 
and it was from the owner of one of the largest literary agencies in the UK himself. He told me that he enjoyed my style and that he thought my writing was very well, that my ideas were creative and inspiring, but that sadly he wasn't going to be able to offer me representation, nor did he think with any of the other agents. The reason for this was simple. My work simply did not fit any of the pigeonholes beloved by the publishers. So in short, it was again the same old objection. My style did not fit that of a novel, novella, short story, etc. But that email was a game changer for me. I put my pen down. For days, weeks, valuable hours, I just walked the city, rode on buses, sat on benches, and asked myself the same question that was asked after my business died. Who are you? I started thinking again about the kids in my class, and I knew I had the ability and the knowledge to write stories that make people feel better, that help them cope, rewire their brains, better their mental health. I remembered again the ease with which I wrote the script for the rag doll. And then, finally, I thought about the children's stories on CD, which celebrities lined up to come and read, which was so much fun. And for the first time in my career, I wondered if the success of all those audio stories wasn't only their therapeutic value, but also the fact that I am actually a scriptwriter, that my stories aren't meant to be read, but to be performed, whether in body or in voice. Recently, I was invited for an interview at BBC London Studios, and when I walked into that recording room and saw all those familiar microphones, soundproofing and mixes, an excitement stirred inside of me. I was back in an environment I knew very well, an environment I had spent 16 years of my life in, and a seed was planted. What if the stories inside me whispered, you begin again? Yes, I would begin again. I will take what I have learned from my failures and my successes, from my regrets and my rewards, and I will send my stories out into the world in audio form. I will fill them with joy and imagination, with danger and suspense, with humour, quirky characters, and I will sway my body to the sound of the rhythm of my sentences, kajik, 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 until it matches my heartbeat, until it matches the music I could always hear inside of me. I will call it Spoon Press, and it will be bloody brilliant. If you ask me exactly what all the elements are that make my stories unique, I won't be able to tell you, just as I'm sure those agents and publishers won't be able to tell me what exactly it was that made my stories not fit those pigeonholes. Maybe it is because my brain was broken before it got healed. Maybe it is the orange African sun or my refusal to play by the rules. But here's what I do think. I have a friend back in South Africa who is a massage therapist. She has battled with an autoimmune disease most of her life that leaves her often paralyzed with muscle pain for long periods of time, where she can barely lift an arm. The last time I visited her salon for a massage, I said to her that I've had many massages in my life from many different therapists, but that the way she touches is just different. The way she places her hands on your muscles, with such tenderness but also with so much authority, is just different. She shrugged and said, It is because I understand the pain. When I think back on those first stories I wrote for those children in the classroom, I realised that I recognised their trauma because I had childhood trauma of my own. And when I told them those stories, I knew exactly where the words had to go. Like arrows, I could aim them directly into the darkness, with tenderness but also with authority, because I understand the darkness, and I know the light. If you're still here, welcome to Spoon Press. This is the place where I will from now on write and tell my stories. I hope you like them. If you do, please subscribe to this podcast, and remember to like and share the stories. That way more people will find out about them. You can follow my personal journey on my Facebook and Instagram pages. Just look for Anna M. That's E double M. Or go to my website at www.annam.com. You are listening to Spoon Press Audio stories that are good for your mental health. Wow.
Welcome, all story lovers. Dive into the enchanting world of Spoon Press Audio, your go-to podcast for a daily dose of fiction. Whether you fancy brainy masterminds, gutsy heroes, or cheeky lovers, we've got stories to captivate you and sweep you away from the ordinary humdrum of your day. Created by the award-winning author and entrepreneur, Anna M. Spoon Press Audio is a perfect blend of laughter, intrigue, and suspense. But also, these stories are specially designed to boost your brain power and mental well-being. So be sure to hit the subscribe button wherever you listen to podcasts. Join us on an epic adventure only at Spoon Press Audio.